Right. Everybody see this okay? Okay. Well, welcome again, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Denise McGee, I'm with the Work Department, and we are a design and strategy firm that is helping to produce this series. Um, very glad that you could all take the time this evening to join us. So this is the second of our virtual series on public space programming. Um, this series is, is meant to help organizations provide spaces and activities um, for Detroiters to stay active all throughout the year. Um, our last session, I know some of you were with us two weeks ago for our last session with Rochelle Lento from People for Palma Park. Um, and she talked a lot about designing and developing programs and what to think about and how to incorporate community input into that process um, and making sure that programs are designed for, um, for the folks who are actually using the space. And so today we're hearing from Io Thomas and Vic vet fast um, about implementing programs in particular working with volunteers and how to get the word out um, and they'll talk about their experiences at um, uh, with Bilal Conservancy and with Chandler Park Conservancy. So um, <clears throat> let me just there we go. Share we have three more sessions after this one um, and the dates and times are here. Um, our next session is October 14th, and that is about ensuring a safe and se secure space. And we'll be joined by Anthony Benavides from Clark Park Coalition, which is my neighborhood park. Um, and um, so we're looking forward to that and hope you can all join us. The, um, the website is here, pistons.com slash let's play training. So you can go there to um, RSVP for um, all of the upcoming events. And um, the last, last, not last week, two weeks ago session is posted on the site. So you can go back and watch that video if you missed it. And today's session is being recorded and will be posted up there as well. Um, all right, so I wanna introduce everyone to uh, our friend, Patrick Duggan, who's here with us from the Pistons team. And he's gonna share a little bit about our partners tonight. Hi, everyone. I appreciate you all coming in today, uh, tonight, I should say. Um, it's great to see such a, such a good group here, uh, some new faces, and it's great that you're returning from two weeks ago as well. Um, so, yes, I want to thank the William Davidson Foundation and the Ralph C. Wilson Foundation, who uh, have been incredible partners and sponsors for the Neighbors Program and have made this possible tonight. Um, so I want to thank them uh, first and foremost, um, and, of course, to Denise and her team and Project Play and the Detroit Parks Coalition, the work department in the city of Detroit, uh, who have you know worked tirelessly to pull this all together for us. Um, and this is incredibly beneficial um, virtual series that uh, I think can uh, really you know teach a lot of people uh, some important important topics that we need to cover and can help a lot of people and activate these wonderful public spaces that we have in Detroit. Um, and if you were here two weeks ago, uh, we mentioned it then, but I want to remind everyone that there will be an opportunity to apply for mini grants through the Pistons Foundation. Um, we'll have details coming out for that soon. Um, that should be opening, should be opening up next week. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, and uh, we'll have more details uh, soon for you. So I'll kick it back to you, Denise, and we can kick off the, uh, the session. All right, thanks, Patrick. Yep. Uh, before we go on, I'm gonna have Ayo and Yvette just say a couple words, introduce yourselves, and um, tell us a little bit about your organizations. Ayo, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, Good evening, everyone. My name is Ayo Thomas, and I lead community engagement over at the Belle Isle Conservancy. We are a nonprofit partner to the state of Michigan Department of Natural Resources, helping to bring programming, uh, manage volunteers and other resources um, on Belle Isle, as well as to support park users and park experience. Really looking forward to chatting with you all today. Thank you, Yvette. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Yvette Pullum Bass, and I am the program director for the Challenge Park Conservancy. Uh, Challenge Park Conservancy is also a nonprofit organization. And what we do is basically fundraising, development, and programming at Chandler Park. Uh, Chandler Park is a city-owned park, so we work very closely with the individuals at the General Services Department. Um, and yeah, ultimately, 
we are tasked with implementing a $20 million revitalization plan for Chandler Park. Yeah. Thanks. All right, before we jump into their presentations, a um, couple things about our format for the session. Uh, we're gonna have, I'm just gonna share a few more guidelines and uh, some housekeeping and then um, I always knew that we'll each present. We'll have ample time for Q&A at the end. So um, as they are speaking, you can put questions in the chat or, or hold on to them to the end. Um, we're gonna ask that everyone um, stay muted during the presentations. And, and if you um, are mistakenly unmuted, we might mute you. Uh, don't take offense to it. We just wanna keep the um, you know, extraneous noise uh, to a minimum. A um, couple of guidelines for our conversation tonight, uh, just, just so that we're all you know, here together, uh, respect each other and, and our varied experiences, give each other time and space to ask questions, ask questions and participate. And of course, if you have to step away, please feel free, um, just make sure you are muted. All right, so let's dive in. Ayo, I'm gonna turn it to you to uh, present. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Um, so yes, as I shared, I um, am leading community engagement over on Bell Isle and um, I shared a little bit about our mission, but I would like to just offer a little more context. Our mission is to protect, preserve, restore and enhance the natural environment, historic structures and unique character of Bell Isle as a public park for the enjoyment of all now and forever. Within that context, my role specifically is to learn and to educate, um, to build relationships, understand community need in order to inform our institutional strategy and decisions, to help us to advocate for park users and park experience, to increase the visibility of our mission and work, and to support conversation and knowledge sharing between the community and our organization in order to fulfill our mission. Okay, um, and so I like to, before we get really into the programming, um, set some context. Belle Isle Park is still a city owned park, um, which sometimes gets a little bit uh, misinterpreted, but we are still a city owned park. We are managed by the state of Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And of course, as I shared, we are um, supported by Belle Isle Conservancy and our four, our four focus areas are people, planning, programming and preservation. Um, and so today I'm going to spend some time talking specifically about programming, but also, of course, about people. And so while these um, four areas are coming up, I do want to share that because we are a nonprofit partner to the island, um, we are, of course, able to do some things and we have some flexibility in terms of presenting programming, which is different from that of the DNR because they are a governmental organization. Um, and so we are able to maneuver a little bit differently in terms of our institutional structure. But that does not absolve us, of course, from the um, policies and procedures, the permitting, those sorts of things that are required required for presenting um, programming on Belle Isle, and we do still honor those um, typically by securing uh, permitting and all those other requirements through the events office on Belle Isle, the same as any other institution that might be interested in presenting on Belle Isle. And so here we have just a couple of photos. Um, I wanted to just show you the range of activities that we do because the conservancy we're about 10 years old as a matter of fact our 10 year anniversary is next year and so we are the um, combination of four organizations and with that we actually um, came in inheriting some things um, and so what you see here um, is the programming most of it is um, like, for instance, Holiday Stroll is about 30 years old. And so we have a range of programming that is some of it predates us as well as some of it um, has come um, under our time on the island. Um, and so I want to just clarify that when we say programming, we speak specifically to events that are free and open to the public. We're talking about um, something that speaks to a part of our mission. Um, 
or is operations related. So it might be um, something like connecting with the public. It might be highlighting some of the heritage of the island. Um, it might be um, operating the aquarium, which is one of our programs, right? So we have four major programming that we do annually. That's of course, the operation of the Belle Isle Aquarium, which is free and open to the public um, Thursdays, well, excuse me, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 10 to 4. We also do Koi Festival to honor the Koi collection and the relationship between Detroit and Japan um, on the island. And that is the first weekend in May, typically the first Sunday. And that is um, typically aligned with Boys Day, which is a Japanese holiday or Children's Day now is um, what it's called. We have Belle Isle Holiday Stroll, which is our major winter programming. And that typically brings anywhere from 1,500 to I think at the most we've seen 7,000 um, visitors. And that um, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. And our newest is Fairy Doors on Belle Isle, which I'm gonna speak to just a little bit later. And it actually begins for this season next week. So you all can come out and join us for that. Um, and so with that, of course, I've shared uh, that that is, um, it has to meet those three criteria, right? So if it if it's charged, if we charge for it, it no longer counts as a public programming. Um, if it, you know, loses its mission focus, typically that is no longer considered a public programming. We can call it an event or a fundraiser or something else. But if it doesn't meet those criteria, then we um, move into a different realm of classification. And we can go to the next slide for me, please. Thank you. And so here, and I was hoping that you all would be able to see it a little bit more, but this is Belle Isle Holiday Stroller. These are just a couple of the pictures. Um, and what we have here is actually um, a couple of photos from a traditional year, which you see like the Santa Claus and we see Kim Brady here with the violin. She's the urban violinist. We have um, the MDNR. We usually do a stuff a truck program where people can bring, um, it's a community service element where people can bring toys, which typically the DNR um, donates through the um, DPD has a Sergeant Santa program and they deliver toys. And so this is our way of contributing to that um, through our partnership with the DNR. And really it highlights their partnership and their um, contribution as part of this event in a way that is of course fun and family friendly. Um, and here is just an example. This is the Renaissance High School Choir. We usually have um, several choirs and performances um, that highlight our DPSCD partnership. We also have a couple of other organizations and you see like um, Kim Brady, who is not of course a part of DPSCD, but is a participant through our partner and relationships. And then the other things that you can see here in the corner um, that is Powabic Pottery. They typically come out and will fire for us on site. And so people can um, create little vessels and then fire those on site. And then the picture frame and the um, this cover here that you see that's an illustration of the aquarium. Um, those were our additions from last year because of course we went virtual. And so we wanted to maintain some of those elements, including the magic of visiting Belle Isle. And so last year looked a little bit different. Um, we took on the approach of an audio tour with a coloring book that we were able to distribute at various partner sites throughout the city, which allowed us to expand our reach, um, as well as an element, this photo frame is currently on Belle Isle. It's right near Sunset Point and you can go take a photo. That was our Instagrammable moment. We wanted to still make sure that there was something engaging and on site um, beyond just driving in your car and listening to the audio tour. So right here, I wanna talk a little bit about our process. Um, and what we typically do is we start with an internal conversation. We wanna talk about what's our vision for the year? Um, what goals do we need to accomplish? Are there any things that we need to modify from the previous year of programming? Um, and if it's a new program, um, what gaps are we looking to fill or just what do we really need to be aware of and cognizant of? After we take that, um, have that conversation, you can see there's these two um, kind of written documents with the scratches on them. Those are what we call an event brief. And that is where we capture all of our information so that it's easily shareable um, either across the department or with partners or um, anyone who might need that information. And so on the event brief, you would find, um, again, what our goal is, who our audience is, what the elements of the event are, 
um, what steps are appropriate if there's any permitting needed and what other resources um, are necessary necessary in order for us to um, achieve this particular or to implement this particular program um, and we follow that basically all the way through after we complete this document we usually will have a kickoff meeting bringing all of the um, like island partners to the table any um, like it's typically island partners, um, any staff needs, any um, necessary parties, stakeholders in order to bring the event to fruition. Um, and then we will go over this event brief, go over those details, find out what the contributions are from those partners um, in order to capture that information. And then we typically will just set a cadence for meetings and check-ins to make sure that we are um, maintaining our timeline and staying on track. Um, and so then beyond that, once we once we set this tone internally, we're then able to move externally, connecting with any partners that are not on the island, um, any vendors, any talent that we really want to um, connect with. Because one other thing that we do when we have these kickoff meetings is if there's a gap in the programming plan, then that's where we fill it. And that's typically where we can gather recommendations or some of those other um, needs from um, our in institutional needs, but to be filled, of course, by the conversations of our island community. And so um, 2019, um, we actually were able to expand um, and we included a um, holiday market. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we went through that process, but it was important for us to connect with small businesses and to highlight um, businesses and people who support Belle Isle through this um, kind of economic mechanism. And so we had a small um, holiday market and we um, went through that process. It was actually very successful, but that went through um, sort of like a, a vendor call and that sort of process, which I'll speak to in just a moment. Um, and it's really important also to just acknowledge that this event works really well because we don't usually have much of a barrier in terms of digital access because it is an in-person event um, we're able to basically bring people to the island and once you get on the island you're able to access everything um, we have um, shuttles that will take you from spot to spot and so some of those barriers are eliminated the issue i think in terms of digital divide for this is how do we market to people who are not online how do we connect in those ways um, beyond social media beyond our typical um, and usual um, mechanisms and so if i could go to the next slide Okay, so this is just, it looks a little jumbled, but this is a little bit of information about our community engagement feedback campaign, which is the second type of programming I want to speak to. Um, this, in as of 20, well, we've had ongoing conversations, right, about community engagement. What does it mean to be in relationship with the community? Um, and as of January of this year, we began implementing a three-phase um, community engagement strategy. Our first year was dedicated to um, assessing our current, you know, um, our current stance, our current relationship, as well as to um, building and identifying relationships that needed strengthening or um, to be established. And so what you see here is um, the card that we use, which gave a little bit of information because always we're in conversation, right? So it's as much about education um, in a two-way format. What can we share as well as what can um, we get really of value that helps us to make decisions. And so we produced these postcards that were left at various places around the city. Um, we also sent it out electronically. We also were literally and physically on site for six weeks throughout the summer with iPads and um, paper copies, just making sure that we were able to um, answer questions about this, this feedback form, to encourage people to take this feedback form, um, or to give us their feedback, um, and to do so on an ongoing basis. And so what I wanted to put here um, is just a couple of examples of the kinds of questions that we asked. Um, and what you see here is like, what primary language do you speak um, outside of at your home? 
So, you know, we can assume that English, of course, is a language, but what else is happening? Who else is a part of our community? And what are those needs that may not be addressed um, in the way that we're currently addressing them? And then things like, why do you visit Belle Isle? What sorts of um, things would you like to see on Belle Isle that are not currently in existence? Um, and I'm actually gonna just share that link with you right now um, in case anyone here has, um, you know, is a visitor of Belle Isle and has not had the opportunity to contribute in that way. Um, but this programming here took a different direction because it was not um, it was not something that was intended for fun per se, or it wasn't that sort of outreach. It was more so informational outreach, and so it required a little bit of um, different internal conversations about our expectations and outcomes and goals, um, as well as how we hoped to um, identify. Um, and clarify what success looks like, right? Because success for an event is people have had fun, they've enjoyed it, they've connected. Um, but in this case, our success was, did people give us an honest opinion? Did they share, um, you know, did they answer questions? Were we able to get enough of a um, pool of folks that we can connect with beyond this survey to ad address um, additional questions, additional opportunities, that sort of thing. And so that's what success looked like um, in this space. Yeah, and so I want to just address really quickly what you see here, um, sourcing talent and vendors. These are the ways that we um, build connection with new talent and vendors, right? Because there are people, of course, who are part of our network, a part of our family who we can call on. We can say, you know, this is something we want to do, or we have obvious, obvious partnerships. You know, our um, education team works very closely with DPSCD, so it was natural for us to reach out to their fine arts department when it came time for us to look for performance, right? And so there are some of those natural connections and natural alignments that we speak to, but beyond that, how do we connect with people, right? And so typically it is a referral or a recommendation from our team. We also do things like vendor calls um, if there's an area that that we just um, are, are looking to expand. We also have a, a rule of um, three proposals or three options before we make a decision. That's our general practice. Um, but sometimes we know that that just is not possible if there are other constraints at play. We also do RFPs in that same three proposal um, minimum applies. We, of course, go for referrals in terms of vendors as well. Our next step is to expand our network, right? So how do we go beyond digital divide? How do we go beyond the people that we already know? How do we go beyond the people that are familiar in our network and that our network knows? How do we expand that to be a more um, general opportunity um, so that everyone who is you know, a member of our community, whether we know them or not, can have that same level of access and input um, into contributing to our programs um, at whatever level makes sense at the time. Okay. So this is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a really big one. And as I shared, we came on board um, as a formal institution in 2011, and we are um, a product of the joining of four institutions to create the Bell Isle Conservancy, which means that there are some things that we inherit, right? But in a more broad sense, in a more general sense, there's a really big difference. And this is something that we've noticed, particularly through our feedback form this year, um, and just through observation as well, is that there is a difference. This is also a question we ask, our, ask ourselves. What is the difference, or is there a difference, between making our programming available to the public and developing programming for the public? And what we've learned is that when we make our programming, or when programming is made available to the public, it may not necessarily be um, relevant. It may not necessarily be something that is of interest to the community you serve, but it might be something that your institution has decided that you want to present, right? And when you are dealing with programming that is for the public, it is something that is done um, typically in response to a desire or a need and comes organically up through um, community channels and is typically supported um, and is visibly um, um, successful. 
And so what I can add to that, <clears throat> excuse me, as I shared, we, we worked on um, a community engagement strategy this year, um, is that we wanted to evaluate our programming based on this. Um, is our programming relevant? Does it, is it programming that is available to the public or is it developed for the public? And we're somewhere, honestly, probably in between. Um, and we, we do strive to um, continue via ongoing conversations um, to increasingly make our programming inc increasingly relevant or to highlight what is relevant, which simply is um, underexposed. And so the last um, kind of question that we ask ourselves and that was actually posed, I think maybe by Denise to us is what role does equity play in our communications? Um, we have a lot of conversations. <laughs> when I first got to the Conservancy, um, Michelle, who's our CEO, Michelle Hodges, she asked me, what's my favorite word? My favorite word is agency. Right, so we um, have these discussions. I am of the belief that people, places, things will tell their own story and can advocate for themselves if you understand the language, right? And so that applies to nature, that applies to places, that applies to the people of Belle Isle. And so when we are thinking about the role of communications, um, our goal is not only to uplift equity, but to encourage agency and independent relationships with Belle Isle and to support those independent relationships, right? We're only 10 years old. There have been relationships with Belle Isle for long before we existed. And it's important to us that we acknowledge those and support those in whatever way we can, while also maintaining and supporting our partnerships um, with the other tenants of the island, as well as the DNR, which is, of course, the primary caretaker. Um, so that is my answer for that. But we, of course, are always looking um, to converse, to, to expand our knowledge and to grow um, as we can. Okay, and as I shared, we um, last year launched a ferry door um, program on Belle Isle. And it was really popular last year. We had 17 doors, which spoke to different things. Um, everything from um, the koi that we have on the island. We had a Dia de los Muertos door. We've had doors that speak to conservation and fish. Um, and this year we've focused um, on the nature of people and places of Belle Isle. And those doors are landing next Friday, October 8th. And so we hope to see everyone out we thought that it would be like a youth and family friendly thing, but we saw um, date nights and individuals and it just really was a really um, joyful opportunity. And so we really hope to see everyone out on the cultural campus. That's the aquarium, conservatory, um, grassy area and the gardens. And so, um, yeah, please come and join us October 8th again, they're launching on Belle Isle. And finally, This is my information here. Um, so please do check out our website if you'd like to learn more. You can also connect with me via email. Um, if there are conversations that you would like to have, if you have additional questions um, or input or um, would like to establish or strengthen your relationship with Bella, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Hiya, thank you so much. Uh, I know I have a few burning questions, but I'm going to hold them to the end and we'll ask everyone else to too. Um, and I just wanted to pull up here. We also have uh, your social media for Belle Isle Conservancy, Angie here. Yes, please join our digital community. That's what we call, it. that's how we reference it's our digital community. Please join us. Yes. Um, so again, if you have questions, you can start putting them in the chat anytime and, and we'll, we'll grab those and hold them to the end. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to turn it over to Yvette. All right. Great. Good job, Io. I learned some great things about the Bell Isle Conservancy. I'll be at the fairies. I'll, I'll be there. Um, so again, my name is Yvette Pullum Baz. I, my profession, I'm a master's. I have a social work, master's in social work degree. Uh, compliments of my wonderful friends at Wayne State, right? Um, so definitely being able to have that urban context uh, and being a native Detroiter, I am definitely invested in Detroit. So um, I work for Channel Park Conservancy and we are a relatively new organization. 
we have been around since 2014. Um, and ironically, despite the great things and the large impact we've made on the East Side, we only have two staff persons. So um, myself as the program director and then Alex Allen is the president and CEO. Um, so Challenge Park Conservancy, we have, if we have four, four areas of focus, the first one is more so the environmental and conservation. So what we believe in and when we develop amenities at Challenge Park, we like to include some type of green stormwater infrastructure uh, component with the development at Chandler Park. Um, Chandler Park is a approximately 180 acres. Uh, 100 of the acres is the Chandler Park golf course. And then we have um, another 80 acres of programmable space. We actually feature the Wayne County Family Aquatic Center. Uh, it's a great amenity for those of you who've never been. Um, it's the hidden jewel of the east side, I call it. So um, there, and then to date conservancy, we've probably raised approximately $8 million in developments at Chandler Park. So in addition to fundraising, doing developments, we feel it's an obligation um, to also program those spaces that we develop, right? Um, so go to the next slide, please. Do I have control of this? All right. So um, we're gonna, what I would like to discuss is really just some best practices along programming um, and you know, having that social work background and community development. Uh, we truly believe in utilizing a bottom-up approach. So the bottom-up approach is basically, you know, asking residents, stakeholders, constituents, you know, what is it that you would like to see at Chandler Park, right? Um, I have some ideas and ideologies about way things could and should go, but ultimately um, it really isn't up to me or, you know, the powers that be. It's really basically the individuals who come into the park and utilize Chandler Park. Um, so we have a $20 million revitalization plan. It's a conceptual plan. It's definitely fluid. It's always changing. Um, and so this plan was put together by a group of stakeholders that also included residents and businesses throughout the community. Um, you know, they kind of figured out, you know, these are some things that we would like to see at Chandler Park. Uh, and uh, Alex and I, you know, we kind of, with our board, our great board, right, um, figure out how to make all of these things come to fruition. Um, and then once we get that amenity developed, we um, began programming, right? And what I said in regards to developing programming that is representative of the population and individuals who live there, or programming that's for the people. Um, that is definitely something that we look at. You know, uh, we have quite a few amenities at Chandler Park. We have, um, we just last week got some new basketball courts, compliments of the Brent Hill and Fila Foundation. Um, we have tennis courts that were funded through the Ralph and Mary Wilson uh, Foundation. Yes, skate park that'll be completed at the end of this no, the end of October, um, you know, that's through the skate park uh, project, formerly the Tony Clark Foundation. Um, we have a multi-purpose athletic field. It's marked for football, soccer, as well as boys and girls lacrosse. So, and doing these different developments, right? We house the Detroit Youth Lacrosse Program. I like to say that it was the first lacrosse program um, in the city, and it was catching on. It is like the fastest growing sport in the country right now. But um, we house that program, right? And we actually currently are compiled of parent volunteer coaches. Um, we play in a suburban lacrosse league. We provide all the equipment to the young people. We provide transportation to and from the games. Um, and so, like, the kids definitely love, love, love the sport. So right now we're in the process of organizing a three-on-three -three youth basketball tournament. Kids in Detroit love basketball. 
right? So you get courts, now you have to program them or um, the tennis courts. We work really closely with community partners. Uh, Detroit PAL is one of our biggest, biggest partners when it comes to programming the park and different amenities. Um, flat out tennis, we have a local resident who has his own tennis program. He's like devoted to young people in tennis. So um, he, you know, we do programming and we also try to be very intentional on recruiting or getting members from the community, um, local from, the, from Detroit to be the face of a different, of a program or to lead the program um, because as we know, children are more comfortable seeing people who are familiar, you know, people that look like them or just uh, is relatable in some context. So um, very, very intentional on when it comes to recruiting coaches and different things for different various programs. Um, right, one thing we definitely learned when it comes to programming is not making promises you can't keep because it becomes a big challenge. Uh oh. <laughs> all right. Um, and then, you know, just keeping resident stakeholders abreast of all the challenges and developments in the pipeline. Um, you know, we, in doing this, the last, the most current development we're working on is the skate park. And the rain has like brought a lot, a lot of challenges at one point. Everything that the developers did kind of got washed away. Um, but, we have a skateboarding class that we're going to be starting up uh, next month. So, you know, typically folks will probably figure, hey, Detroiters don't skateboard, but there is a large population of individuals and young people who skateboard and the skateboard community is uh, unmatched, right? So next month we're going to be providing skateboards, helmets, and perfect protective equipment for young people to actually learn how to skateboard, right? Um, so even just like really some best practices when, you know, kind of developing your program um, and just really being transparent and inclusive of everyone. All right. Can we go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, how to get the word out about your program. So as you're, you know, talking to your residents and you know, stakeholders and different people, young people, older people, um, you know, you got to kind of figure out, yeah, we're definitely, social media has a large presence now. Um, so we promote our programming on different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, right? We still actually get out and do door-to-door -door flyering. Um, we have some services that we work with that we pay for a robocalls to go out. Um, you know, some people they'll call you, definitely gonna call you back. Um, and then, you know, it's definitely a good idea to possibly invest in the constant contact. Uh, so as you're doing these different events and you're collecting individuals information, um, you're gonna build a database, right? And this database then you'll import into your constant contact and you will be able to then you know, with the click of a button send out a flyer um, through email, right? Um, so constant contact, you know, definitely, definitely, definitely a great asset when it comes to getting word out about your different programming. Um, and then, you know, it was always best word of mouth, right? Word travels, especially in Detroit, <laughs> right? So um, a lot of the things that I probably take my young people to or support them is typically somebody told me about it. Like, hey, you wanna go to Bell Isle, you're doing this or Palmer Park is having Harvest Fest this weekend. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go. Okay, it's a great thing to do. Um, especially when it comes to free, free events and free programming. Uh, one thing about us is most of our programming is free. Um, we do have, um, a signature program that we actually host. It's the Chandler Park Youth Sports Program for Youth, but um, it's a six week program, um, Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We go over golf, soccer, lacrosse, archery, uh, baseball, and soccer, 
All right, and it's Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. Um, the youth engaged in about 45 minutes of each sport daily. We provide lunch through the city's Meet Up Eat Up program. Um, we've probably been doing that for about four years now. At one point, we partnered with the Robot Garage to offer robotics. Um, we partnered with the local credit union to come out and do a, a session or two on financial literacy. Um, we even partnered with the Fifth Precinct and they come out and do a session on engagement with law enforcement, right? So we're introducing these definitely relevant topics and these tools to help with youth development, um, critical thinking and you know, conflict resolution, different things that our young people should be um, learning. The next slide, please. All right. Now, um, volunteerism is a large, large part of our programming. Um, even for like our summer program, uh, we have volunteer coaches, we have volunteers, uh, guest speakers. And right now, I think uh, volunteerism across the country is probably like at an all time high, right? So um, when you're looking to develop a program, you know, I'm always, volunteers is always like at the forefront of uh, programming events, right? And because we do have such a small staff, for me uh, and for CPC, we like to identify a volunteer leader. Right, and this individual is going to be that person who's um, going to be approachable, personable, right? He or she um, will have some familiarity with some of the individuals, but then have a clear understanding of what it is that we want the program or the event to be, what, what is it that we're trying to accomplish, and you know, making it become successful overall, right? Um, so Typically, you know, myself and this volunteer leader, we may have a meeting and discuss, you know, how many volunteers that we think would be ideal for this particular program or event, right? Because at this point, um, we'll see this in step. All right, so we're gonna, you know, identify how many volunteers, you know, do we need 30 volunteers, do we need 50, or do we need 15? And so, um, you know, then putting together a spreadsheet of saying, you know, what will these volunteers be doing? You know, we don't want anybody just standing around, um, not having anything to do, or just twiddling their fingers and thumbs. You know, uh, we want everybody to know that they're all a part of the success of program and the, or the event. All right, so we're gonna identify the various roles um, and positions the volunteers right will be needed in. If you need somebody to be a registration, right? If you need someone to be a greeter, if you need someone to direct traffic or parking, whatever that role is, this is where you would go ahead and identify those various roles. All right, and then who can help? Where are we gonna get these volunteers? I mean, obviously you have your immediate like network of volunteers, the people who support everything you do. Um, I love those people, right? But also looking at the potential organizations. Um, I like to kind of start locally on the east side, you know, um, east side community network, um, Osborne Alliance, uh, Operation Get Down, whomever it is, right, see who we could get to come out from these organizations um, on this particular day and support this event. All right, we also get with the schools, so whether it's uh, the local charter school or DPSCD, um, you know, most high schoolers requ are required to do so many hours of volunteerism. Um, so you say, hey, you know, this would be an opportunity for them to come out, uh, especially corporations. You got the Quicken families, uh, you know, you can make a phone call to them. I mean, we've had people come from the Nike Community Fund. Uh, banks are really big on volunteerism. And I mean, we've had FCAs, or Stellantis uh, come out and support uh, volunteer days. So, you know, you kind of want to 
go through your checklist of or who who can help, right? Um, and this is something we are doing, like identifying. So once you get to the date event, right, you want to make sure, if possible, some budgets are constricted. You know, I understand. But having volunteers wear T-shirts, maybe a lanyard, right, some name tags, it's something to identify them as a volunteer um, or someone who has information who could be of assistance to any of the event participants or um, your programmers, anybody participating in the program. So this is a part, right? The next thing is, you know, so you have, you know, how you're gonna identify your uh, volunteers. I think it's very important to have an orientation or a briefing with the volunteers, right? Before the event, if you can meet up like 30 minutes prior or hour prior to the event, you know, and the one thing I will say about the pandemic, it has definitely brought out uh, this Zoom and like being able to have a Zoom meeting. And you don't have to necessarily come into our office or meet us at the site, but look here, we're gonna do a orientation, a virtual orientation, and just kind of do a virtual run and show of how uh, the actual day of the events are going to go, right? Uh, or even, uh, for the volunteers who are going to be participating in your program. Here, we're going to do a virtual orientation about, you know, what this program is intended, you know, what your role is and what the expectations are. Um, so I've, this pandemic has definitely been beneficial. I mean, ooh, it's a lot of means I think in the past that we could have did virtually. Um, so yeah, definitely have an orientation, right? And then once you have the event, it's always, always, always important to get um, feedback from the volunteers about the event, as well as the participants. Um, I think for every program, it's kind of always do an evaluation at the end of the program, right? And not only just from the program participants, their parents, like, you know, what is it that I call it an after action review or like an AAR. So it's like three sustains and three improvements, right? Um, was your goal met in different things? So definitely getting feedback. Um, and then when it comes to implementing the program the following year, you know, where you need to make any changes. All right. All right, so this is just some of the program. I really, I love this, our lacrosse program. Um, these are some images. This is like our first year of the lacrosse program. We actually played um, in a tournament and we made it to the playoff. We didn't win, but, you know, being a first year team and going to the playoff it is phenomenal. Uh, you got some pictures here of our girls and uh, these are young men, the Panthers. Uh, so yeah, we this is this is our signature program um, for use. And just so you guys know, for those of you who didn't know, like we actually helped start the program at Cast Tech, right? And we're actually looking to uh, start a program at Renaissance uh, in the spring for the cross. So yeah. And, this, and I will uh, mention that most of our programming that we do is more so for youth between uh, seven to 13. We don't really have a lot of programming for um, the high school uh, population. And then we do programming with uh, seniors. We partner with DAAA um, for, we do a senior appreciation event. Uh, it's a wonderful event. The singers look forward to it every year. Uh, it's a live blues band, and we do actually Pawabi come out, and we did pottery. You know, we do bingo. Um, we provide food and music, and they just love, love, love. I want to say the first year we did a program, we probably had 200 people. The second year we had well over 800. Um, so, uh, you know, you, if you get it right. You, know, you get more people. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic kind of put us at a halt for the same appreciation, but they really wanted to do it this year. And I was just like, uh, let's just you know see if we can get our vaccine numbers up a little bit. But um, 
yeah, so we do the, oh, the next slide, please. Um, oh, here's our uh, youth golf program that we do at the golf course at Chandler. This is just a picture from the Singer Appreciation Day that we hosted. Um, also, when it came to, you know, acts and individuals do, when it, we got the opportunity presented to us to develop a skate park at Chandler Park, you know, we had to first get a skate park advocate in our community. So we have Kevion Richardson, who lives three blocks from Chandler Park. He's an avid skateboarder. Um, and he came in and spoke to the residents here about skateboarding and how it impacted his life and um, how the skateboard community, you know, he feels put him on a path where he wouldn't have been doing some deviant behaviors. But um, so, you know, this is like I said, you know, that bottom up approach. Because had this group of individuals said, you know what, we don't want a skate park at Chandler Park, we would not have had a skate park at Chandler Park. So, um, you know, this is just one of the focus groups we had with some community members about the amenity at Chandler Park. Um, the next slide, please. Oh, there we go, Detroit Powell in our tennis program. Uh, this is a few years ago. But yeah, uh, you know, and Powell provided trophies and t-shirts to all the young people. Um, it's a very successful program. And for those of you who are not familiar with pickleball, um, it's a really, really fun sport. It's kind of like tennis with ping pong paddle and a wiffle ball, and it's on a smaller scale tennis court. But um, yeah, so we did a pickleball clinic. And in the center, that's Mary Wilson. So Mary Wilson, uh, uh, the Wilson, Ralph Wilson Foundation, right? Mary is, she was a, tennis player, Olympic, and yeah. So definitely in like when you develop your programming and your events, it is imperative that you include the individuals, the wonderful organizations, the people who help support and fund and make all these things come to be. So um, that that's something that, you know, you definitely want to include in your program and give opportunity to come out and support and see all the great things that they're doing. All right. Um, all right, yep, our environmental education program. This is a wonderful, wonderful program. We have young people where we teach about conservation. Um, and like here, I believe we were out at the marshland. Oh, Chandler Park has a marshland. It's like a wetland in the, on the east side, right? It has like 250,000 million gallons of stormwater that's captured off of the roads inside of Chandler Park. So this past summer, uh, we actually were able to go out to the park and they took some water samples. You know, they just tested for different things, uh, potassium, dissolved oxygen, nit nitrogen, right, to see if the marshland would support any type of aquatic wildlife. Um, that particular test wasn't, but by the time we got to the end of it, you know, we could support some turtles and some snakes. But um, yeah, so... And that program uh, was actually funded through the FCA Foundation. So, um, yeah, and we work with Wayne State. I think some of the Wayne State uh, students there, they have a great program. Getting with the universities is definitely a great way to kind of um, get your educational program or your athletic programs off the ground. Um, they're always looking for opportunities, the teams and the uh different schools of social work or environmental sciences, right, to come out and engage with the community and young folks. And then up oh, the Chandler Park uh, Gardening Club here. So next Tuesday, we'll be building out the Chandler Park Community Garden. Uh, this, we have a group of about 30 community gardeners who have been dedicated and diligent in their efforts when it comes to developing the uh, community garden. So you know, we give out transplants, we partner with Keep Growing Detroit, uh, Smallville Farms and other different community garden groups. And uh, you know, these folks love, love, love gardening. I've learned so much from them. Um, so yeah. Um, 
was there another slide part? And this is, you know, I didn't put a slide about how to contact me. I'll put my contact information in the chat, but that is our website, ChandlerParkConservancy.org and our different social media um, handles. All right. And that will conclude my presentation. All right. Thank you so much. You're going to turn me into an Eastsider. <laughs> I've got to get over there more often. Uh, let me pull this screen share technology and see everyone. It is really dark in this room that I'm in. I'm sorry about that. Um, all right. I think we're going to um, transition to some Q&A. And my colleague Fatima is here to get us started on that. And then we'll take some questions from you all. I know I saw at least one or two in the chat already. Great, yeah, please keep adding your questions to the chat. Um, and in the meantime, um, I have a couple, uh, one for both of you um, to start with. Um, what's a top lesson, um, maybe one or two that you learned during the pandemic that you think will be applicable going into the future? Io, do you wanna um, kick us off there? No pressure. Um. <laughs> I think uh, one of the first lessons that we've learned is um, about being nimble um, and being able to um, um, really just adjust. I think we, we did a pretty good job of adjusting in person, but really being um, able to be fluid within the medium um, in order to provide support is a very important lesson that we've learned. Um, I'm trying to think of what others. Um, What's the size of your team, Ayo? I don't know if we heard. That. Oh, we we are a team of sixteen. Okay. Um, so we're you know we are also a small but mighty team um, here over um, near on Belle Isle. Um, I would say that, and then you know make best use of your talents, right? Because when you are constricted um, in other ways and you have you know a volunteer core which we do we have a very strong volunteer core um, and we originated from four volunteer organizations so um, just being able to um, speak to the strengths both of your staff and of, of your other supporters um, and really working within those two to be um, to ensure success is probably the other um, important one um, lean on your supporters but also be someone they can lean on those are our two. Thank you. Be an organization they can lean on rather. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Um, you bet. Yeah. So I want one thing that I believe we've learned in, from the pandemic is just the importance of being able to stay in contact with your volunteers or just the stakeholders, the community residents. Um, so something that we we've, we've done. Uh, you know, the robo calls, right? Just checking in on people. Hi, how are you doing? You know, this is your vet. Uh, you know, we'll have a friends at Chandler Park. We is our kind of like our ambassadors of the park. They kind of get the word out about what's going on at Chandler Park. So, you know, keeping them up to date about what's going on uh, and still hosting those bi monthly week meetings um, in a virtual context, you know, and, um, pictures 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 um people love pictures you know even though we were in a pandemic we still were doing things um we still had the marshland going on the walking path was being installed in Chandler so um Alex he literally went out and recorded right uh, he took out his drone and made video footage so uh just basically stand in communication with the with your with your with your people. Mm -hmm. People who's been there to keep me a website up to date. <laughs> so yeah, um, but definitely you know you know working remotely and you know it's a great thing, uh, especially you know. I'm having a little bit of trouble just, hearing you, Eva. And then I have youngness that'll be at home, you know, just being compassionate. Yeah. Uh oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. 
Yeah, I'm hearing similar threads um, with both of your responses. Um, obviously, relationships and people are central. Um, a follow-up question, I think, that connects um, to both both um, conservancies programs. Um, what, what if any, is the role of like youth volunteers um, and like youth voices, specific subset in developing programs? So we have. Um, like when we did our, our skate park development, the funder required us to have a youth advocate. Um, so we definitely you know, had a young person at the table who was given input. Um, I actually sat there and took notes and had questions. I was kind of taken aback, um, but you know, it also kind of gave us the idea like we need to include a young person on our board. Right. Um, we work really closely with, uh, we have participants from the Road Detroit Young Talent Program who come in and they work with us throughout our summer program. So, you know, we have them take the evaluations in regards to high programming and, uh, and what they would change or what we should add to the program or whatnot. So, yeah, having some type of youth voice is definitely, definitely, you know, something that we look to include mm -hmm. in our programming. Having a young person um, or people on the board um, sounds like an incredible way to go. Yeah. Ayo? I was just listening to your answer, Yvette, like, yes, that those are some, some lessons I'm learning from you right now. Um, <clears throat> I think historically, um, our programming has been kind of adult-led, um, if I'm honest. <clears throat> we do, of course, have some youth voice um, through and we get youth um, program, excuse me, youth feedback through our education programming specifically, um, working through the um, Detroit Passport Program. But I think that is an area where we could really um, grow. It's an opportunity for us to grow and to build some connections. I did notice um, youth feedback in our feedback form. Um, but of course, if we're looking at consistent and ongoing, um, I think there's opportunity for that with us. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I think the first one, do either of, um, of you partner with DPSCD? I believe both of you did mention DPSCD, um, but if you could talk a little bit more about your relationship with them, um, or Vicki, you had a particular um, sort of framing of that question, feel free to jump in. Um, I was wondering, because I knew at one point, Go Lightly Career Tech would work with Belle Isle. I didn't know if that was still going on, but I'm wondering if they do reach out to like the career tech centers or uh, DPS. Yes. So um, if you're speaking, I know Go Lightly had the greenhouse. One thing right. that's important to also acknowledge about Belle Isle is that although the Conservancy is a nonprofit partner to the state of Michigan, there are actually several entities which manage the various facilities around the island. Um, one being Detroit Zoo with the Nature Center, the Dawson and Detroit Historical Society, just to give a couple of examples. Um, and so, yes, there are some current and existing partnerships. Um, the Conservancy specifically works with the um, you heard me just speak about the passport, which is third through fifth graders doing field trips that come to the, both the aquarium and the conservatory, um, as well as Hamtramck students, which we see every third, fourth, and fifth grader, unless, of course, there's some sort of barrier every school year. Um, we also have, of course, um, I spoke about DPSCD and their participation in our holiday stroll. We also, our education team does some professional development through relationships with teachers and educators who, um, some of whom, I think 42 so far, have been a part of DPS um, in terms of their educational staff um, and and we also have on our community engagement committee, um, a member of the DPSCD school board. And so we, we do have definitely a, a strong relationship there. Um, and we're always looking for ways to expand our reach and to um, impact the lives of students in the city. Great, thank you. Um, Yvette? Yeah, so we don't necessarily have a strong partnership with DPS. Um, we are looking to develop so in regards to our environmental education program, the goal is to, we're working on developing curriculum, work with Wayne State, their School of Environmental Sciences, and they're 
uh, TRUST program. So it's transformative research and urban sustainability training, right? So in developing curriculum, yes, she told um, me. master partners, and um, the goal is to develop an outdoor environmental education uh, classroom where we would do one week of training or four days. And then that fifth day, they would come out and do like actual hands-on experiment with the various uh, either soil testing, uh, water testing, water quality testing, different things. So that is something that's actually in the pipeline. Uh, however, we actually have a really great relationship with the charter schools um, around the park. So um, Barack Obama Academy, uh, Detroit Enterprise Academy, um, Hamilton used to be a, a charter school, but it's back to DPS. So um, yeah, we have a, probably a stronger relationship with the charter schools in the community. Thank, thank you. Um, another question, um, in your community outreach, which media gave you the most bang for your buck? And I wanna add my own question to that. Um, tag like a tag, a long question. Um, what community outreach may have reached like the most uh, marginalized populations? Hmm. I would probably say for Chandler Park, it's the door-to-door -door flyer. Um, and more so because you have people who live in a community who probably haven't been to Chandler Park in over 10 years, right? Um, so we are definitely working on changing that perspective and the reputation of Chandler Park. So, you know, we're doing flyering or, you know, we're putting posters up or whatever, um, driving them off. You know, I tell everybody, like, I challenge you, just, you know, just ride through the park. You know, when you get an opportunity, um, just go across the street, go a few blocks up. Um, so, yeah, but definitely the door to door flyering, I believe, is, has gotten us the best turnout. It sounds like it's also maybe the one that's gotten you the people that, we're not easy to reach. Right, and that's probably where a lot of our like consistent volunteers come from. Okay, great. So a lot of, a lot of bang on that. Yeah. Right, I have. Um, I would say that our, we've, we've had, I guess maybe different success based on different mediums. So for instance, when the aquarium reopened, we did um, like a media day and we also spoke directly to and invited educators who have been with us doing their professional development online. And those folks that gave us, you know, um, the most bang for our buck when it came to reopening the aquarium, um, when it came to, um, community outreach in terms of feedback, the thing that has been most helpful is literally visibility, right? So if, I, if I'm out with my shirt on or, you know, people who know me or encounter me, they know that I work, those one-on-one -on -one conversations, having a face that they can place with a place that they're familiar with has been um, probably our most effective because it's a chance for us to, one, listen, for them to um, humanize whoever the staff is and support, right? But also for us to educate and offer that um, direct response, sometimes, you know, um, quelling misconceptions or just whatever that requires. That one-on-one -on -one conversation um, is probably the most effective. But if you want to talk about from a technology standpoint, placing flyers with the QR code has been our, our most helpful. Um, yeah. For the one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, like how do, you, how do you document those? How do you sort of track them? Um, yeah, so it, it really just depends on what the conversation topic is. Sometimes it is um, a follow up email. Thanks so much for your conversation. You know, here's here's the result or here's what was promised. Um, so that's one way. Sometimes it is, um, especially over the summer with our campaign. Sorry, guys. Um, so it, it, it includes um, feedback, right? So people who actually take the time to scan that QR code and give us their input. We've also um, noticed Google Analytics. So people who visit our website, we're able to track some of those things, um, increase in visitorship, increase in touch point. It really just depends on what the conversation goal was. Um, and sometimes it is um, what is lost 
as a result of that conversation, right? So what things are we able to, um, are we able to remove a barrier to access? Are we able to remove um, a misconception or a misinterpretation? Are we able to remove something that um, increases a positive connection with Belle Isle and with the Conservancy? Mm. Um, thank you. Um, so we, we've heard, I think, a, a lot about the great work that both of you are doing and, and your organizations are doing. And you've been really frank about, you know, where there may be gaps or where improvement and room for growth. But um, can you each share a time when despite, you know, all the best planning efforts, uh, things went wrong? Um, sure, let me just try to think. Uh, something may have went awry. You know, we were probably, our, this upcoming Tuesday, October 5th, so we partnered with um, a school, uh, UD Jesuit, they've done great things, right? They have a pledge day when they come out annually, and we've probably had like 150 young men come out um, to support us and different things, done things from painting to pulling trees, weeding, planting, However, the pandemic, I don't know if everyone is kind of aware, like the school bus driver shortage. So basically they need like 36 buses to be able to transport the young men to all different sites. And we, I literally just got a call yesterday, like they only got four buses what? for the whole school, right? <laughs> <laughs> so like we're gonna build a community garden on Tuesday and we're gonna plant like a thousand native plants. <laughs> So it's really like, okay, I'm going through that list of, of who have we had volunteer in the past where I could get like at least 50 people out here to help with this task. Cause I got soil, compost, plants, like raised beds, everything that'll be here on Monday. <laughs> You're like in a high stress moment right now. Yeah, so sometimes there's as much planning as you think, you know, you definitely have to be flexible and um, just open-minded, right? There's, I got it. Alex and I, we call ourselves the GSD, right? Excuse my French, just to good, get ish done, right? Actually, Michelle <laughs> point Alex and I as the GSD crew. <laughs> Michelle Hodges from the Bell Out Conservancy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, we're going to get it done. I love that. Oh, goodness. Our, our team, um, is a figure it out team as well. Um, we have a really dynamic leader, um, director of events and um, communications who has helped to really facilitate a lot of our programming, but also um, that's the public programming. I've also spoken of course about our education programming which comes to our education team. Um, and so I think, I think the largest um, kind of inescapable issue or or challenge we faced was pandemic right we how do you produce um public programming in a park when it's really not safe to gather um i think that that was a challenge that of course everyone faced last year um but we really saw creativity and to uh yvette's point from earlier those connections that we were able to maintain i i don't know how you do a festival virtually but we did, right? We were able to pull off Koi Festival virtually, highlighting um, different aspects of um, Japanese culture and, you know, the Koi Festival and, and um, relationships with the Koi on Belle Isle. Um, we were able to do that virtually. Um, the same for Holiday Stroll. We were able to take that programming virtually and even increase our connectivity because at this point, we we're able to, you know, move um, beyond the physical space into relationships that make sense on and off the island. Um, and so, the challenge, of course, was that we we have these plans, we have these things that people have come to expect that we've done year after year, and then you face a point of absolutely you cannot gather, it is unsafe. Um, and so, um, yeah, so so that was that was our challenge. Um, but our team really um, took on the approach of you know what's the worst that could happen. The worst that could happen is you know we could not be successful but if we don't try if we don't try to figure out how to continue to service to continue to provide that essence of what people have come to know and love and expect um you know then we're we're left 
basically with nothing. And so um, that was that was where we were. And I, I would say that definitely we learned some lessons, but last year was a success because we were willing to take that risk. Mm, a lot of problem solving and troubleshooting. Um, there's, a, yeah. there's a question I'm in the chat, uh, Yvette, for you about how do I get information on the Chadwell Park October 5th event? If you can. Um, yeah, I uh, sent David my direct phone number. All right. But, I mean, yeah. And I think I put my, the work number. So that's actually due to the pandemic. My office phone is transferred to my cell phone. <laughs> and I haven't changed it back, even though we're back in the office. Like it's it's just really convenient, you know. So yeah. Um, so I have another another question. Um uh I you said specifically um like a two-way format um in the community engagement where you share something and ask for something. And it sounds like that's happening with um with the work that you're doing an outreach to a Chandler Park where you know you're doing door to door, but you're sharing about something, asking some questions. Um uh can you both share more specifically like what 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 are you sharing? What are you asking? A few examples. Sure. So my first question I typically ask and if it's like when is the last time you've been in Chandler Park? Right. Um and you know, you get a lot of ooh, back in the day, or whoa, it's been a while. Or you may have somebody say, you know, I'll bring it through there. And man, there's a lot of great things happening at Chandler Park. So um, you know, so I asked, you know, when's the last time? Because I am I'm proud. I love my job, right? I'm ecstatic about the work that we do. And um, you know, so I but one of those challenges is like because of the new developments that's going in Chandler Park, um. We definitely get a lot of, oh, it's a county-owned park, you know, um, the city don't own that park, or it's, I'm like, no, it's a city-owned park, you know, I, I keep a business card, you know, <laughs> and so I'm like, here, you know, it's go on our website, channelparkconservancy.org, um, and, you know, you can look at the things, and I also invite individuals to our Friends of Channel Park meetings. It's a bi-monthly meeting, um, and they could come and express, you know, any concerns or questions, or also if there's something, let me tell you one thing about us. So because we are only a two-person staff, when it comes to programming, I mean, we program, however, we would really love for other organizations to come in and do the programming, right? Um, so like the flat out, you know, and what we have developed is like a three uh, different levels of support. So either it's a Chandler Park a signature event, right? Or it's a Chandler Park sponsor event where we may provide some financial support, or if it's just a, a Chandler Park conservancy supported event where we're going to assist with the uh, outreach, with some recruitment, or just getting the word out. So we do have like three different levels of engagement when it comes to activities, events, and programming that occur at Chandler Park. But you know, when it comes programming, we definitely would love for you know, an organization to come and say, hey, I want to do a, a basketball camp, you know, and we say, great, we have access to hundreds of children, we can get the word out for you, right, um, in that capacity, or, you know, if we want to sponsor a team, um, things like that, so. Uh, uh, which is key to your, your work. Right, 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 yeah, take some stuff off my plate, <laughs> yeah. So from our end, we, um, community engagement specifically, we, our goal is to kind of amplify our work, our value, our mission. Um, we also spend some time, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sharing ways to connect one with the conservancy. Um, historically, we have um, produced the Bell Isle Beat, which was something that spoke to um, monthly all the events that were happening at the various facilities around Bell Isle. So that was something we were doing. We also historically have done a newsletter, obviously with the pandemic um, and, and being limited in terms of on on site activity, that wasn't something that was happening in the same way. Um, and so we've had an opportunity to really evaluate, excuse me, one.
Okay, um, so we um, we also spent some time clearing up misconceptions, right? We we heard um, Yvette speak about whether or not the county owns, um, you know, Chandler Park, and that is a very big because the state manages Belle Isle, um, and it is. Um, operated in some ways that are very different than people who would have um, visited Belle Isle prior to the state's management, people think that it is now owned by the state, right? So we do spend time clear, clearing up some of those areas of confusion, um, highlighting who does what, who's responsible for what, um, as well as what's happening at the aquarium. There are people that don't know it's open. Um, and it's been open, you know, for almost, um, I believe, since 2012. And so we're, we're working on another 10 years. And there are people who don't realize that it's open, right? There are people who don't realize um, what opportunities exist on Bell Island, some of those other things. And so we do spend time educating in that space, talking about our mission, talking about the work that we do and the ways that Belle Isle is impacted by our work. Um, but we also spend time um, learning, right? because park users are the ones who are having the experience. Park users are the ones who have the expertise about what it is that they want and need. Um, that doesn't speak to infrastructure. Obviously those are you know, specialized and professional roles, but um, definitely we spend time toggling between the two um, and also sharing things like uh, meeting points. So Belle Isle Park Advisory Committee. That's a way for you to find out monthly what's happening on Belle Isle, what infrastructure is being updated, what changes, what road closures, all of those things, as well as to leave public feedback, as well as, um, you know, city council, we do a presentation every year. Um, we're required to as, as part of the, um, the lease between the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit. And so sharing information and supporting that is another area where we um, share out um, as well as do some listening. Great, thank you. Um, we're right up at 7.30 right now. Um, are there any final questions from anyone, um, any of the participants? No? Well, this has been really informative. Um, I learned so much um, and I have to make it out to both places soon. Um, uh, yeah, Denise, do you wanna wrap us up? Yeah, just, just to echo that and say thank you. And thanks for to those of you who joined us tonight and stuck around. We appreciate having you. Hope that you join us again um, for our upcoming sessions. And uh, maybe we can put the link in the chat again really quickly in case you missed it at the beginning. Let me do that now. Um, Did I say and, um, Denise? I'm sorry, what? I, I just want to, this is one thing I, I don't believe I actually slipped my mind. But um, so uh, Chandler Park and Service and Alex has been paid had been providing leadership for a new organization, um, the Detroit Parks Coalition, right? Uh, so DPC is made up of um, Chandler Park, Clark Park, Belle Isle, uh, Bruge Park, uh, Palmer Park, right? We got the Riverfront Parks, Midtown Parks. Um, and so basically what we're doing is we're all coming together and it's the Detroit Parks Coalition, um, right now we have an interim leader, Sagal Hemi, who's a dynamic young woman. Um, so basically we're just gonna start working on collective programming across the different parks in the city and branding and marketing and just really lifting up the Detroit parks. So for everyone who is here tonight, um, we are in the process of putting together a newsletter that's gonna go out and kind of highlight the different events and activities uh, that each park is gonna be hosting throughout the fall. Um, so I don't know, if, you know, if Sagal is going to do a website or whatnot, but, um, definitely please look out for the newsletter. Um, and we will probably most, all of the organizations probably will post something on their sites regarding the DPC. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing about them. I, um, we, we've been really appreciative to work with Sagal on this series, and she's been really helpful in connecting us with speakers like you. Um, and uh, we're, yeah, we're excited to see what comes of the coalition. All right, well, thanks everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and we hope to see you again in a couple weeks. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night.